Justin. Okay, so today we're going to start chapter 15 of Romans. And as we said last week, um, we gave a little bit of highlight in there. Romans is kind of, chapter 15 is kind of letting us know that, hey, listen, we're on the, on the same playing field. There's no hierarchy here, right? We're to humble ourselves and let's just understand that it's all about Christ. And we're just doing what we can. And so don't get into that routine that destroyed Israel, right? Because they put themselves into a spot where, hey, I'm a high priest. So... I want you all to worship me, you know, and oh, you're just a lowly peasant. Jesus changed all that when he came. He went to the lowly peasant and exalted them, right? Jesus is the author of the least shall be first, the last shall be best, um, and he's the author of the little guy. And so Paul is rebuking a little bit and saying in chapter 15, don't take that for granted. Don't exalt yourself. It's all about exalting Jesus. So in, in chapter 15, 1, why don't you read 15, 1 for us, Justin? We who have strong faith should help the weak with their problems. We should not please only ourselves. So, if we're spiritually mature in Jesus Christ, why are we? What makes us spiritually mature in Jesus Christ? Faith, right? We step in front of God and we say, I want to understand this. We have the Holy Spirit, so God imparts the Holy Spirit's power into us to help us understand it. We didn't do anything to earn it other than what Frankie said, we had faith, right? So when we start to learn more and more and picture a rose, when it first comes out of the ground and it's on that green branch, it's a little red egg, right? It's a small egg. But as it starts to open up, there's all these beautiful layers, right? That makes it so interesting that opens up the truth to us. That's not our work. That's God's work. So when we're in that stage that we can actually see the truth of Scripture a little bit easier than we did when we first began, we should not be going in front of people and saying, oh, no, no, silly you. This is what it means, right? Paul is taking us back and saying, remember when you first believed what you were like so don't play that game of I know more than you because God has a way of humbling you real quick like Nebuchadnezzar right I did all this as he's walking along the the top of the castle and he's praising himself for everything that God did for him and for seven seasons he was doing what he was being a pig out and a wild boar out in the wilderness eating grass. And God said, okay, you want to take credit for what I've done in your life? Then here's what you get out of it. And Paul's just bringing that back home again. So he says, you have strong faith should help the weak with their faith. That simple. Um, verses 2 and 3, please. Each of us should please our neighbors. Let us do what is good for them in order to build them up. Even Christ did not please himself. It is written, 
The bad things people have said about you have been aimed at me also. So Jesus came as what? A servant, right? He came to fulfill the the law. He came as uh, God born in human form to live life dealing with every single possible confrontation that Satan could throw at him and still overcome it. But even in the midst of all the battles that he had to endure, he was still concerned about the little guy, right? Eating with the tax collector. And like Frankie just said, that was the person that Jesus would go to, right? The people that people would say, you know, you're worthless, you're not valuable, or you're not. Jesus said, the world is wrong. You're more precious to me than they are, right? And that whole scenario... Why would Jesus leave the 99 to go and find the one? Right? Because the 99 were all set in their own mind, right? But the one was lost and scared and beaten up. And that was the most important one for Jesus because they were vulnerable. Right? And that's what he wants us to do. We can hang out with all the good people that got it all solved. But how does that benefit the one that's lost? Right? If we ever get to the point where we have a sermon on the um, the good shepherd. Or uh, the good Samaritan. Right? Let's view it. As the Samaritan laying in the ditch, watching these people pass by, right? One was a pastor, crosses the street as you're laying there, dying to make sure he makes it on time to praise the Lord in the sanctuary, right? And Jesus was the good Samaritan. He said, I don't care what I have planned for today. Today, you're the most important thing. And he does that for everybody. Absolutely everybody. And we are only where we are because the Holy Spirit gave us the wisdom as we asked for it. Right, Because when I first started and I opened up this book and I made the mistake of having the New King James, it was the, a language that was Greek to me. But as time goes on, the wisdom had me open it up like that rose again, right? And I could see how one piece of it connects to the other. And I think the person who describes it the best is James in chapter 1. So that's our first scripture that we have off to the side um, is James chapter 1, 1 through 7. So if you're there, okay. Justin. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Okay, hold on. So, this is not the original 12 James. This is the stepbrother of Jesus, right? Because the original James had already been um, martyred. Notice how James is talking to Israel. He's talking to the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? Not that there's anything wrong with that. The original 12, including James and Jude, 
as add-ons were still going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and whoever wanted to acclimate along those same lines. Whereas Paul, the one that we're studying, was focused on everybody as a whole. And it doesn't matter who came in front of him, Jew or Gentile, he wanted everyone to understand this. Exclusive from circumcision, exclusive from the Sabbath, exclusive from the law. It's a one package deal, saved by grace through faith, is Paul. But here's James giving some very truthful promises. Go ahead. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its works, its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not generous, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not, not doubt, because one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So what God wants is for us to be honest and say, this is what I need, Lord. I'm sitting here. And I'm reading, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and I'm totally confused. Please explain. And that's when the Holy Spirit says, okay, you know what? You're honestly asking me, so I'll explain how Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was right in the beginning. Right? And everything was made by him. And he was not only God, but he was also manifested in living form, right? And he is the Word. So this whole book is because Jesus put it all together. Now, different um, personalities, but every word of Scripture is because God the Son wanted it to be in that position, in that place, in that order, and according to exactly what was written. Without a mistake, right? All God breathed. So, here and there, God makes very clear, if you want to know more about my word, just ask. But do it with a real heart. Don't just lip service it. Right. If you want to see if this is really true, I will show you. And I've made this statement before. If you've never believed on anything in your life, and you know you dabble a little bit in Buddha and a little bit in Satan and a little bit of Ouija board and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, If you just say, God, if you're real, and Jesus Christ, if you're really the Son of God and the only way, then tell me today, otherwise I'm not going to believe it. And it comes sincerely, you will get an answer that same day. Guaranteed, promised. But you got to be sincere, right? And so if you want wisdom... He'll give it to you, and he'll give it to you in abundance. Get ready for it. (laughs) Right? Right? Uh, Verse 4 alone, please. Um, Sorry, do you mean James verse 4, or you mean, sorry, back to 15, Romans 15, 4? 15, 4, please. Everything written in the past was written to teach us. The scriptures give us strength to go on. They encourage us and give us hope. So... God's book is not only there for us to learn from the mistakes made in the past, right? Because mom and I were talking today again how about 
I believe that we're heading into 1930s Germany. Right? Let's get into that socialism. Let's build up. Um, we can do this through money. We can do this through money. But um, meanwhile, there's an ulterior plan in place. And before you know it, it's too late. All right? Because that's what happened in Germany. Now, I know that from first hand because I had many conversations with my grandfather who was also blindsided, right? He said, here comes this great guy who says, hey, listen, everyone's starving. There's no, no money, no food. Um, I'm going to build autobahns. I'm going to build railways. I'm going to make us prosperous. I'm going to design a wagon for the people. In German, it's called a Volkswagen, mm. okay? So, wow, that sounds great. Sign me up, right? Now, his devious plan was to have a quick route into other countries to overtake them. And, of course, those pesky Jews had to be eliminated, right? But when you get on that bandwagon and you think that the world is um, better off because of this guy, it's easy to be blindsided. Right. And so it's an easy trap to get into. And especially with the herd mentality. Right. Everyone goes in that direction. And there was not um, a main train station where they were loading Jews on and taking them away. No, this was all done in secret by eight, nine percent of the people. The masses had no idea what was going on. Right. So this is something that. Paul is telling us, and it's common sense, watch out what Scripture says. Because Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the coming of the Son of Man comes. And we know that the flood caused millions of people to perish, right? Because they were... They had no use for God. And God tells us, oh, by the way, it's happening again. Sometime in the near future. Right? And that's why it's important that we use Scripture not only for history. There's nothing new under the sun. The wisest man in Scripture prior to Jesus had claimed. And he was absolutely right. It repeats itself. Right? And so if we don't if we don't learn from the mistakes that happened before, we're doomed to repeat them. Um, the days of Noah, for example. Um, and <laughs> I put this in there. And he already has, right? So if we look at the end of this book, and that's another reason why we need to watch the scripture, because at the end of this book, he also tells us what's going to happen, right? So we won't be surprised when it happens. Now, the, um, the rule of thumb that I put in there, I'm going to stick by it. If the majority says it's probably the right thing to do, it's woke. Stay away from it and don't even touch it and read the scriptures and find out what the correct way is because the majority is almost always wrong. Um, scripture also tells us that God 
protects his people. Right? There's not one incident in the history of the Bible where anyone that was righteous was left behind to deal with God's wrath. They, uh, the bad people were rounded up, ca- encapsulated, and demolished. But those that were righteous were always saved by the hand of God. And that's there for our encouragement. Right? Um, five through seven, please. Our God is a God who strengthens and encourages you. May he give you the same attitude towards one another that Christ Jesus had. Then you can give glory to God with one mind and voice. He is the God and Father of, the Lo- of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has accepted you, so accept one another in order to bring praise to God. So, God is the one who strengthens and encourages us. He does that in a couple of ways. One is when we have that good feeling in our heart that it's going to be okay. Right? It might not. Right. It might not look so from the outside, but we have that it's going to be okay. As my mom says, trust in the Lord. Right? When we have that feeling of. Somehow we're going to get, I don't, I don't know how, but somehow we're going to get out of this. That comes from God. And scripture tells us again, hey, listen, it's going to be ugly. The The world's going to start to groan and moan. People are going to say evil things are good. People are going to say that good things are evil. And that's not it. There's going to be more. The earth is going to start to grumble and earthquakes and famines and wars and pestilence. Yeah. Right. But he tells us these things have to be. Okay. But fear not. Every time he tells us something that is, oh, no, I don't want that. He says, but fear not. Fear not, I got you. Okay? But it has to be this way. So that we're not blindsided. And those that don't know Christ, don't know the God of our Bible, the only Bible, don't know that. They're getting slapped around. And they're reaching for what happened during COVID, right? The common cold freaked out the whole world. Okay. Yes, a lot of elderly people passed away. But, you know, it was a a power storm of, well, turning to Satan and Ouija boards and seances and... um, You know, as Pastor said in one of his sermons, you know, witchcraft has gone through the roof, right? Because we want an answer. What's going on? Well, open up the book. It's right here. So it's it's just that, that God does not leave us without the knowledge that we need.
has strong foundation, and wind does not overtake you anywhere. But if you are on sand, you've got flip-flops on, and you're on sand, you're going to get taken off your feet. You're going to fall. Right. The foundation is Jesus Christ. If you don't have that foundation, you cannot stand. And, and that's, that's the deal. And so Paul is saying here, Paul is saying right here in what uh, Justin just read, our God is a God who strengthens and encourages us, right? May he give you the same attitude towards one another that Jesus had. Because we can be strengthened in ourselves, but guess what? If we're strengthened as a group, we're even more strong, right? So we need to encourage one another and strengthen each other as a group. Then you can give glory to God with one mind and one voice, Scripture tells us, right? Because several different opinions and several different voices confuse the issue. But if we have one mind and one voice rooted in your foundation of Jesus Christ, then we're immovable. Um, verse 8, please. I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews. He teaches us that God is true. He knows us that God will keep the promises he made to the founders of our nation. So, Jesus became a servant to the Jews is something that the Jews did not want to hear. They wanted to hear Jesus came to knock out the Roman government and to set up his kingdom. But if they would have read that same scripture that we were just talking about, he was going to come as a suffering servant and also as a lion of the tribe of Judah, right? And the suffering servant part was what he came for. He came to show us that, you know, to be least is greatest. So he came to be a servant um, to the Jews. He teaches us that God is true. He shows us that God will keep the promises he made to the founders of our nation. What was that promise that he gave to Abraham? Yeah, I will make yeah, exactly. I make you I will make you the father of all nations, and through your seed all nations shall be blessed. Right? That was the promise to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so on the second part of that first printout is Genesis twenty two, I believe it is. Yeah, Justin, why don't you read uh, Genesis 22, 13 through 18? Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of, of the Lord it will provide, um, the angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you um, and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their na enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me okay so god kept his word again right because two thousand years later god did exactly that 
with the birth of Jesus Christ, he blessed all nations, right? Because now anyone could come to God. You didn't have to go through a high priest. You didn't have to be a Jew. You didn't have to do anything other than trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, it was not overnight, right? But think about all those people that were sitting in paradise for 2,000 years. It was 2,000 years that they were waiting um, prior to this promise. And then another 2,000 years before Jesus would come. But they knew that God said it, so it will happen. Right? And that's when Jesus Christ was crucified and he set the captives free and he went down and he preached in paradise, took them with him to heaven. And it's as simple as that. But they were all in paradise because they knew at some point God is going to do what he said he was going to do. Right? And they were both, they both had the same option. They were both ruthless thieves that did nothing good in their whole life. And they both started out mocking Jesus. Right? But one said, leave him alone. He truly is the Son of God. Please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? All he had to do was recognize Jesus Christ. God doesn't ask us for anything more. Recognize Jesus Christ and you'll be in with him. Like I've said hundreds of times. If it would cost $26,789 to be saved, people would beg, borrow, and steal it and make sure that they were saved. God says it's free. Free 99. All you have to do is ask for it. And I'll give it to you. Oh, that can't be. That's too easy. No, it's not. Because he paid the price. And it cost him everything. So it's not easy for for him at all. It's easy for us. So. All of the nations will be blessed. Because of what Abraham um, believed on God for. And this happened when Abraham took his one and only son, Isaac, up on that mountain to sacrifice him. And God stopped him in the very last second and said, No, now I believe that you have faith. He gave him an offering of a lamb to sacrifice instead of Isaac, which he did. And then he went back down the mountain with Isaac. On that same mountain. 2,000 years later. God did exactly the same thing. Except for this time. He sacrificed his one and only son. Right. And that's why scripture is so important. Scripture in this case also repeated itself. Right, so we learn from other good things. It was the same mountain. Yep, Golgotha was the same mountain that um, Abraham went up to sacrifice Isaac. And on the way up, with all the servants and everything else. Yeah, but listen to this. On the way up the mountain. With all those servants and donkeys and everything else. Isaac holding a bunch of wood for the burnt offering, which was him. Right? And started heading up the mountain. And um, Abraham said, don't worry. 
the boy and I are going up to worship, and then we'll be back. There had never been a resurrection. There had never been anyone brought back to life. But Abraham knew that God said, Out of your son, your one and only son, Isaac, I will make a great nation through which all the nations of the world will be blessed. So he said, okay, if God's going to have me go up and sacrifice them, then God's going to bring them back to life. That was the faith that Abraham had for not one, not two, but for three days up that mountain as they journeyed together. And when Isaac said, I see the wood, I see the rope, but I don't see the sacrifice. And Abraham said, choking his tears, I'm sure, don't worry, the Lord will provide. And he did, right? And hence, my favorite name of that time is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Well, he had the dagger up and and the angel of the Lord, which I believe was a theopony of Jesus Christ because angels can't bless. And the angel said, you know, stop. Now I know that you trust me. It had to be um, Jesus, uh, the son of God. Right. And and boom. The second he said that, he noticed the tham, the ram caught in the thicket, right? Because the second we notice Jesus Christ, our eyes are open, aren't they? We might not see the answer to our problems laying right there in front of us, but the moment we believe, our eyes are opened, and then we can see the exit plan, right? Um, 9 through 12, please. Jesus became a servant of the Jews. He did this so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercy. It is written, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, you Gentiles, be full of joy. Be joyful together with God's people. And again, it says, all you Gentiles, praise the Lord. Let all the nations sing praises to him. And Isaiah says, the root of Jesus, of Jesus will grow up quickly. He will rule over the nations. The Gentiles will put their hope in him. Okay, so um, the root of Jesse um, will grow up quickly. And Oh, Jesse, I'm sorry. Right, that's uh, all right. I, I, but all of these prophecies, Isaiah, Psalm, Deuteronomy, 2 Samuel, and Psalm 18, um, Psalm 117 and Psalm 18, all very clearly say that God has a plan for Gentiles. Right? So why, after 4,000 years, did the Jews hate the Gentiles, right? We saw in, in Exodus 19.6 where God said, I, I will make you a nation of priests so that you can go out. You'll be my special people. So you can go out and tell all the world about me. I'm keeping you separated. I'm, I'm keeping you safe. I'm keeping you from intermarrying so that you're my Jewish nation to go out and let everyone know about me. Right in the middle of the 
Right. And they didn't believe God, right? He said, listen, let's take one step into the promised land and I will do all the work. I will slowly drive out the Canaanites so you can take over their apartments and their businesses. And I won't drive them out too fast so that, you know, some of the stuff goes to waste. I'll drive them out according to as you grow. So you can just go in and open up the register and start selling um, because it'll be all set for you. And they said, nah, can we send in some spies? Because I don't really think that's going to happen. Yeah, and they're we're like grasshoppers and, you know, come on. And no, it's right. And that's, yeah, but that's what it was. They were happy with themselves we're God's chosen people forget them Gentiles forget the other ones we're saved that's all that matters except for in God's eyes right and that's why I, I repeat this over and over and over again that's why we're not zapped out of here the moment we believe on Jesus Christ because we have work to do we have to let other people know about Jesus. That's our only purpose in life, period. Not that just that we're saved. That's just the beginning of the journey. That's called the born again phase. And if we're born again, we're still babies. We still have a whole life ahead of us. Working for Christ, right? Who is our, our new father? Let them know, hey, this is what I got. I want to tell you how you can get it. Right? And that's what the Jews didn't do. And we'll see in a couple of minutes how Paul um, is so happy with the Gentiles for coming up with a donation for the Jewish, the church in Jerusalem. Right? The Gentiles got a hold of the gospel. And they were like, yeah, how can we help? Where can we help? Tell us what we need to do. The Jews got hold of the gospel and they said, all right, we're going to keep it to ourselves. But there will come a time when they will be professing Jesus Christ to everyone else, but it won't be till the millennium or till the tribulation period when they recognize him whom they had pierced. God has a plan, and it, it's so much easier if we just stick to his plan. Um, the Old Testament was peppered with God saying that he was going to reach out to everybody, including the Gentiles, and we saw that in, in those five scriptures. Now, uh, Romans fifteen thirteen. May the God who gives hope fill you with great joy. May you have perfect peace as you trust in him. May the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with hope. All right. This was not a mistake that he says hope, great joy, perfect peace, hope. And he adds in there just because you trust in him. Right? Right? Because that's the whole Bible right there. You can have hope. You can have peace. You can have joy. If you only just trust in him. Right. And if we had we had a conversation a couple weeks ago. Um, 
with somebody who said, I, I can't believe how everyone is just so angry and so unloving and well, they don't have Christ, right? Because if you have Christ, because of your faith, if you have faith, you have Christ. If you have Christ, you have hope and joy because you know how it's all going to end and where you're going. Then you can't help but love. But you can't have love if you don't have hope and joy. You can't have hope and joy if you don't know Jesus Christ, and you can't know Jesus Christ if you don't have faith. But he gives it all to us, free for nothing. Free 99. All my favorite words. 14 through 16. My brothers and sisters, I am sure that you are full of goodness. You are filled with the knowledge and able to teach one another. But I have written to you very boldly about some things. I wanted to remind you of them again. The grace of God has allowed me to serve Christ Jesus among the Gentiles I have the duty of a priest to preach God's good news then the Gentiles will become an offering that pleases God the Holy Spirit will make the offering holy so unfortunately the English language does not do this justice okay um, people are an offering that pleases God the Holy Spirit will make the offering holy is hard to grasp our mind around. So I did a Tomism. Okay. Um, what I, I think it's easier to say, Paul is saying that even though we are saved, full of knowledge, right, as he claimed, um, and able to teach one another, we must never forget that we're a living sacrifice. Okay, we've been purchased. Um, and since we are a living sacrifice, that pleases God. Because we're no longer living for ourselves, we are now living for Jesus Christ. Okay, so an offering, us being an offering, just means that we're no longer living for ourselves. We're living sacrifice for Jesus. Right? That makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, and also to humble us. Right? To keep us from walking around and saying, I'm saved. I'm all good. No. I'm still a living sacrifice with work to do because of what Jesus did for me. So the offering here is the living sacrifice and that pleases God when we see it that way and we live accordingly. Right? Because if we're a living sacrifice and we're not as important to ourselves anymore, then we get to see the people that we can help. Right? Absolutely. We have time for others and we can feel compassion for them and what they're going through because we're not so focused on us anymore. Not to say that that doesn't happen. Oh, you know, I'm guilty as everybody else, you know. But more and more, when you rest in the assurance that it's going to be all good, that I'm right where I need to be in God's eyes and that's never going to change, that takes the pressure off of our shoulders to be able to focus more on how can I help someone else have that same peace, joy, hope, and love that we just described. Um, 17. Because I belong to Christ Jesus, I can take pride in my work for God. Simple as that. I can take pride in what I do for God because I belong to Christ Jesus. 18. I will speak about what Christ has done through me. I won't try to speak about anything else. He has been leading the Gentiles to obey God. He has been doing this by what I have said and done. This is our testimony. 
It's as simple as that. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be God sent. Um, <laughs> what did what did God do for me? Let me tell you about it. That and just leading by example, just being a testimony, Christ like example. He's done something for each one of us, whether it's being a 14 year old girl in a foreign country um, running away from home or whether it's been, you know, he's he's done something for us to take us from where we are, where we were to where we are now. Right. But he heard it. He heard it. And and I did and so I was praying for him and his, his family today because you know, I was just reminded. Because you know but that's what God does with us. That's what he does with what goes on in our lives. Tell me, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with fear? Because I how do you deal with that? How do you do it? And impossible situations. I, I can hardly wait to see the doctor that stood in front of Lucia when she when when he explained to her, her how her Hodgkin's lymphoma, I think it was, is gone. And she said, Oh, that was my Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me. It surprised the heck out of him. And I'm sure it made him think, wow, that's something that's out of my professional realm. I can't even fathom, but I see it on the x-ray. I seen it before. I see it now. That can only be what she says. Right? And that's the, the same thing we just said. Our testimony. Right? So why does people, God let us endure cancer or Hodgkin's lymphoma? Maybe because that's the only way to get the doctor to be saved. Or other family members. Or if we succumb to it, maybe other families who members who see that we didn't lose faith throughout all of it like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego in the fire right the strength of our faith through adversity might be the reason why we have the adversity we don't know he knows but all things will work together for the good of them that love him even though we say this stinks it's not fair right why me <laughs> oh I'm good at why me right <laughs> right what about me um, 
Where did we leave off right now? Nin I think 19. at 19 and 20, right? Yeah. You want to do 19, 20? Yeah. Up that? He has given me power to do signs and wonders. I can do these things by the power of the Spirit of God from Jerusalem all the way to the... Uh, oh, boy. Elysium? Elyricum? Elyricum? Okay. All the way from Jerusalem all the way around to... Illyricum, I have finished preaching in the in those places. I preach the good news about Christ. I have always wanted to preach the good news where Christ was not known. I don't want to build on what someone else has started. Okay, so that first sentence belongs to each one of us. We can keep that. That's ours. He has given me power to do signs and wonders. This is not exclusive to Paul. It belongs to every single one of us. He has given us the power to make a difference. Each one of us. No less than Paul's power. Right? And so I can do these things by the power of the Spirit of God also counts to us from Jerusalem all the way to Lyserium um, I have fringe, finished preaching and you know what I noticed when I was writing all this the notes today scripture is peppered also with times dates places events if he didn't mention um, Illus, Ill, Illyricum <laughs> and Jerusalem and uh, wanting to go to Rome we wouldn't be able to picture his journeys right, right. and his 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 traveling and where the Holy Spirit took him and where the Holy Spirit kept him away from right um, but that's throughout the whole Bible um, God throws these little details in here and there just like an artist puts a color here and a color there to complete the picture right to make it whole to make it a complete picture um, 21 please it is written those who were not told about him will understand those who have not heard will know what it all means this is our mission period it was Paul's mission to reach out to the Gentiles and Jews that wanted salvation because they had never heard about salvation right for those who have not been told about him so that they understand for those who have not heard so that they know what it means right the TNT Romans 10 9 and 10, right? How can they hear unless someone tells them? How can someone tell them until it's preached to them? How can someone preach to them unless they're sent to them? Blessed are all who call on the name of the Lord. Well, they can't be blessed unless we tell them. Right? Because that's the first step. We tell them, they get curious, they ask God, God gives them the information, they're saved. But it's a, it takes us to make the first step. That's in Isaiah, by the way. So, none of this is new news. It started out in Exodus, I will make you a nation of priests, and it goes on through to the end of the book. That's our mission. Uh, 22, please. That's why I've often been kept from coming to you. Okay, so 1522 is exactly Romans 1. When we opened up Romans, he was talking about how he looks forward to going to Rome. And I guarantee you it was for rest and relaxation to have some kind of a sabbatical 
to be with other believers in the churches in Rome who are like-minded to kind of have a retreat, right? And he reiterates that again right now in verse 22. That's why I have often been kept from coming you, coming to you regarding what we just said. Those who were not told about him will understand. Those who have not heard will have heard. Because he couldn't come to them who were already on the right track because he still had work to do in other places where people still didn't have the knowledge. And here he's hoping, uh, I'll get that vacation. Oh, I'll get it and I'll come to you in Rome. He came back in chains, right? He went to Rome in chains. And through that experience, exponentially more people were saved than if he would have gone on that retreat. Because he got put in the dungeon, shackled to Roman soldiers, in Caesar's household. The word of the gospel spread like wildfire. They would have never had the word of God because they wouldn't have gone to the churches in Rome. God said, yeah, oh, you're going to go to Rome, but not the way you think. And trust me, the way I think is going to be more beneficial. Because there's going to be people saved that would not have been saved if you didn't go that way. Right? So, him going back to Rome, and, and I can hear his heart. I mean, how many times do we want to just take a break? You know, pastor burnout is five years. A lot of pastor burnout is five years. Now, you're too young for that. But, you know, it's, it's a matter of that there's a lot of stress on Paul and James and John and Peter and Andrew and all of them. It's it's a constant, you know, and as a pastor, you don't retire. There is no retirement from pastor. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is no retiring from being a pastor. Okay, I'm done. You know, I'm 65. I'm retiring as a pastor, and I'm going to go to the Bahamas. Well, you're probably going to. Okay, I've, I've been a Christian for 65 years. <laughs> right. Right, right. Even if you sit back and you go, well, I'm just going to Sunday school, you know, teach and go do, you still, you know, you're called to pray, you're still called to right. play a thing to minister to other people. You're still called to do things. It's a mission. It's a mission. It's not a, it's not a, if you're doing it for the money, then you're not a pastor. You know, it, we all need money to survive, right? But, um, but what happens is, you know, the 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 burnout again. Um, um, in, in the English language, there's so much that's not verbalizable. Um, I don't know if that's a word and hopefully Rebecca will not pick on me for it. But, um, in German, there's Arbeit and Beruf. All right. Arbeit is work. Beruf is calling. 
right? There's a difference. Both make money. You make money on both. But if you're working, it's not as much fun as if it's your calling, right? And so this is our calling. Uh, verses 22, uh, 23 through 24 are basically um, just a reiterating of how he wants to to go to Rome. Um, now there was no place for me to work in those areas for many years. I have wanted to visit you. So I plan to see you when I get to Spain. Obviously, again, our plans are not necessarily God's plans. I hope to visit you while I am passing through. Um, da, 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 da. So this just reconfirms that he longs to, you know, maybe I'll have a vacation on Lake George uh, there for a little bit and, and go to Solid Rock Church and we can reminisce and, you know, but that wasn't God's plan. This is the rabbit trail right now, okay? In 25 through 26, it says, The believers in Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to take an offering. It was for those who were poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were happy to do it, and of course, they owe it to them. The Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings. So Gentiles should share their earthly blessings with the Jews. So the Gentiles, first of all, that was a point that I made a little while ago, were glad to help out the Jews. It wasn't like he was pulling their, their noses and saying, hey, come on, cough it up. Whereas the Gentiles were doing it out of love for fellow believers. Right, and the Jews did not do that. That was the the whole problem that caused all this. Um, but the important thing again here in Scripture is um, he mentions the places: um, Macedonia, Achaia, um, and Asia Minor. So um, all these are important events that God puts into his word for a reason and that's why i got onto this rabbit trail and it's it's important i know we're cutting it close on time but we need to do this um all of if we go on to the next page page 46 on your notes and have by the side of us um that last scripture luke 3 23 through 38 um will understand a little bit more about why God puts little details in his word that are crucial. Crucial. We have genealogies in Genesis 5, in Genesis 11, in Ruth 4, in 1 Chronicles, in Matthew 1, and Luke 3. For example... In Luke 3, the genealogy that's in front of you, um, we see that um, Jesus himself was about 30 years old. Okay, so this is important because that tells us how old Jesus was after he was born at 0 A.D. Um so that we know about how old he was when he was crucified because we know he had three-year ministry right so there's no question about that time frame we go through the lineage um son of heli son of matat son of levi son of melki son of janai son of joseph it goes down through and we get down to the bottom of the left hand column the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Elakim, the son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of Matata, the son of Nathan, the son of David. He had to be an heir to the throne of David. The son of Jesse, the son of Obadad, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Abdiminab the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? 
the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Out of your seed I will bless all the nations. The son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Roy, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Aphraxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalai, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. In the garden, God said, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That ties Adam, Abraham, Judah, David into the lineage of Jesus. Jesus could not reign and rule unless Joseph, the stepfather to Jesus, the, the husband of Mary, was in that lineage as well. Because you cannot reign and rule unless you had all those qualifications. And Joseph, even though he was the stepfather, made him of that lineage that allowed him to be the Messiah. We're talking about 4,000 years of history where Jesus met all the criteria of the Messiah, and God puts that in his book for many reasons, not only to show that Jesus was the only possible one that could have been the Messiah, but also to give us a timeline, right? Um, so if we look at it, um, Scripture points to a 6,000-year timeline from day 6 of creation until where we are right now, right? All those genealogies in Genesis 5, 11, Ruth 4, 1 Chronicles, Matthew 1, and Luke 3 give us ages, and then he died at seven, 969 years old, the father of so-and-so. And so when we look at that Noah's Ark book in the back, it all lays out perfectly, top to bottom and across, in exactly that same timeline. It's unnecessary information unless you're God. Because God puts it in there to verify everything that he says, right? Because you can't make it up. AI could not create a, such a perfect timeline as God did in this book. Um, also, the genealogy is based on before Christ and after Christ, right? Because all of our clock runs off of, we're in the year 2024, 2024 years after Christ was born. Before that was before Christ, B.C., A.D., Anno Domini, right? So God does that on purpose. God invented the seven-day calendar, right? Day six, right? Day seven was the day to rest, right? Uh, he gave the Sabbaths. He gave hours. He gave daytime. Uh, he gave weeks, the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy. God did all this to show that everything is orchestrated exactly as he plans it right um and so that wipes out evolution and it also wipes out billions of years okay and to prove that you, know, you look at things like lunar recession and everything else the earth can't be older than at the very most 10,000 years old so, once again, it falls totally in line with everything 
that God says. And he does that little information that might be useless when you're reading through all those names, but put it all together, it makes a perfect timeline, right? So there can be no discussion. Second of all, God's genealogies help us to see his prophecies, right? Because if we know Isaiah lived sometimes a thousand years before what he prophesied, and we know that what he prophesied came to be, this is more proof that God is amazing, right? So anyone who says, oh, well, Isaiah wrote his book after all these things happened, no, because God put him in that spot to prove that it could only by, be by the mouth of God that um, Isaiah was able to prof prophesy all that. Um, in Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1, Isaiah names King Cyrus 200 or, uh, two decades before he's even born. Um, but he names them and exactly how everything is going to happen. Again, can only happen if we know when Isaiah lived and when Cyrus lived, right? So these genealogies are important. Through genealogies, we also know that 4004 BC was when God started his work in the garden, right? We know that Noah was around 2350 BC. We know that the Tower of Babel was not but shortly after that in 2175 BC. So from the time that eight righteous people landed and everything went to all heck, it was only about 150 years. All right? Once again, looking at history repeating itself. In the 1800s, we were on the right track here in the United States, right? God was number one. If you didn't go to church on Sunday, people would be knocking at your door asking if everything was all right. Now, if you go to church on Sundays, the, the people are waiting outside the door to arrest you. It's not that bad, but you understand what I'm saying? 200 years. <coughs> So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad. Abraham was 2,000 years B.C. Moses, 1,500 years B.C. King David was 1,000 years B.C. So when King David writes his Psalms and talks about the suffering servant, um, that's 1,000 years before it happens. 400 years of silence we wouldn't know about it unless we had a timeline right um, the thing that's that's beautiful for us is the triumphal entry we know was 33 years 33 AD which was exactly 483 years after the decree was given to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem so those people that were in Jerusalem were looking at their watches knowing that the Messiah is coming any day now. Right? Because Isaiah said 490 years till the end, or Daniel, till the end of transgressions. Till the king sets up his kingdom. Dude, we're at 483 years. Let's keep our eyes open. He's coming. So when he rode into town, there was no doubt about it that he was the Messiah right on time. People were naming their, their children, their daughters Mary, right? Because the Messiah was going to be born of a virgin named Mary. Um, the 70 week, 70th week of Daniel's prophecy 
is the tribulation. That prophecy has not been fulfilled yet. But I venture to say 500 prophecies have been fulfilled exactly as described. This one will also be fulfilled. We would not know that we are not going to be there if scripture didn't tell us how in all these times past God has always saved his people believers from his wrath not from tribulation not from trials and torments but from his wrath God has always saved them Sodom and Gomorrah the flood etc etc um, it's all done with 100% accuracy and the only way it could be done with 100% accuracy is if you know when someone said something and when it came to fruition right and so that's why God gives us a timeline so that there can be no debate that those um, those fake soothsayers that say oh Isaiah wrote it long after the fact and it was just thrown in there no you know you can't explain away all the prophecies you know no matter how hard you try Knowing that, knowing that everything is exactly as God said it is, wouldn't that make sense that we can also trust the rest of it? That we can trust how it's going to end? How we can trust that um, we're going to be fine? How we can trust that our loved ones will be fine? How we can trust Jesus when he says, ask anything in, the, in my name if it glorifies the Father um, and it's in his will, it shall be done. Anything. There's not a ask some things. Ask a, it's a promise from God. Well, we know Jesus is God. And so we know that when scripture says on the third day he rose again. And we know that where he went, he went down to paradise because Hebrews chapter 11 tells us all about this holding pattern. Right. Because um, the blood of boats and go um, boats and goats and bulls cannot cannot cleanse sin. They were counted as righteous, but they were in no way or form sanctified until the blood of Jesus Christ sanctified them because of their faith. And he tells us in that same Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. All those things are in here for our peace, hope, joy, so that we can give love. And that's why genealogies are important in God's word. So that we can see the truth of God's word. And I'm sorry if I went a little bit long. But I thought that was important to hit home again. <laughs>